Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. So my name is Yura Pirov, and uh, I worked, have been working one year at Professor Tenbaum Lab at MIT in Brain Cognitive Science Department and Computer Science and Artificial Intelligence Laboratory. And uh, my supervisor was Dr. Vikashman Sinha. And uh, I'm going to tell you about explorations in probabilistic programming. I'm, there is much preliminary work will be presented today. And there are, if there are any questions, please immediately ask me. And some of this, those things are not uh, published yet, so we are going to publish. So, but some of them are published, so we will see. And I'm going firstly to introduce probabilistic programming, which has recently attracted much attention in machine learning and computer science communities. Then I will demonstrate two generative probabilistic graphics programs, models, which we contributed to develop this year. And the first can read text from simple captures and the second can find roads from real-world images. To be more computer vision? Yes, it's connected to computer vision. So it, as the approach is generative probabilistic graphic programs. And it's, a, it's not com pure computer vision as people usually and classically understand it. So I will touch this, how it's different, how it's connected to computer vision and other things. Then I will uh, touch briefly to other research directions I'm interested in. A path to scaling up general purpose approximate inference in probabilistic programs using parallelism, which is based on our preliminary work this year. And also I will briefly touch a much longer term path to automatic programming via general purpose approximate inference in probabilistic programming settings. So what probabilistic programming is? I usually like to describe it using these two bullets. First, it's compact compositional representation of probabilistic models. For example, I hope Many of you know what it is. It's Latin digital allocation model, famous enough, and this is graphical presentation of it. So people who are look, when look to it can understand what happens, what uh, connections here, what dependencies. And this is the same representation of this model, uh, but it's code representation. It's about 300 lines of C++ code. So this is for humans, this is for computers. And it's <laughs> considerably harder to understand what happens here. So now I'm going to show you third representation of the same model. And it's written as probabilistic uh, program. And it's just 10 lines of code. And it produces the same result, the same inference, which happens in uh, written C++ code uh, with one thing that those, that is Gibbs sampling. And this is MH metropolis Huston inference. But uh, there is no problem to make an engine, and we already have preliminary work where instead of metropolis casting we use uh, Gibbs. So is, the, is that, you know, the code that they're showing me, is that the same as the picture? Uh, you mean th no, no, this, no, one. this one? This one. This, yeah, yeah. It's this. I'm trying to figure it out. Yes. Can you of course, of course. So we have uh, alpha, and now it's fixed. Alpha hyperparameter is fixed. Beta, beta hyperparameter is fixed. This is... Uh, topic uh, document topic distribution this is topic word distribution and this is uh, when we get word for each position in text and you can see direct correspondence for this latin digital allocation so classical where's the model. arc for, for example the alpha to theta arc where is that in code uh, what sorry the, the, you know, the graph the arc from the edge from alpha to theta where is oh that? this one eh? this yeah. edge Okay, because we use uh, in document topic distribution in uh, theta, we use alpha hyperparameter, so this is direct dependence. Theta depends directly on alpha. And when we create symmetric digital distribution, there is direct dependence on alpha hyperparameter. So th another good thing that from probabilistic code, you can very easily, from this probabilistic code, you can very easily create this graphical representation, graphical model. And secondly, what probabilistic programming provides you, it's automatic inference, with general purpose techniques. For example, Gibbs, metropolis hosting, SMC sequential methods, um, and many other things. So, 
let's consider probabilistic programming on very simple example, bias network. It's the easiest thing you can write in church. Church is probabilistic language. All people here heard about it. And uh, of course, it doesn't show you the whole expressiveness of this Turing universal language, but it's a great example to explain how church works. So I'm going to show here what happens in church. I don't know how much you're familiar with it. So if it's boring, please tell me, and I will just skip this part. If not, I will continue. So I don't know oh, background. So the, the context here is that that go through details. Okay, so great. Details are useful because you know, we actually also build a probabilistic programming language, but we use more imperative C-like notation. Like we've written models and we have done built inferences and so on. Uh, but I, so I think you know you should go through details and uh, it's fine. We, yeah. we listen. I'm not totally fine. Great. Just not to make you boring. Uh, okay, so this is bias network in its graphical representation, and this is uh, probabilistic code, which is corresponding to this bias network. For example, we have node MVS, and it's uh, distributed via categorical distribution with prior 0 0.1, 0 0.9. And node VMCH depends uh, directly on MVS. So it makes sense. So it's assume it's like saying sample MVS from a category. Categorical distribution with parameters point Yes. So previously in church it was defined. Here in v so I'm showing now Venture code. Venture is a secret project, uh, in quote secret, which is a new probabilistic language, descended from probabilistic language church. And we are going hopefully very soon publish paper on it and make Venture open source, but not yet, sorry. So I'm talking about church, but many things I'm showing really based on Venture. So sorry for this confusion. It's just because we are not as fast as because we would like. In the earlier slide, just go back to the earlier of course. slide, we had a church program. Okay. It, yeah. Church did not have observed statements and so on. Yes. In church, you have MH query. Yeah. So in MH query, you have a bunch of. So this is like, this is actually venture. Yes. This is also venture. Okay. I can rewrite if you want this in church. If it's, uh, okay. Yeah. yeah. This is also venture code. Thank you. Thank you for this. Uh, okay. So this is clear. And how inference happens in uh, the simplest framework, in uh, church uh, random DB implementation, which is based on this paper. So if you I will I will send the presentation, I will provide the presentation, and you can read about uh, random DB implementation of the engine for church in lightweight implementations by Wingate et al. A starts 2011. So how it happens? You make firstly forward evaluation. So you sample from prior all nodes. You sample this from prior, then you sample this from prior condition on this one, and so on. And you sample all nodes once, so for each node you receive its value. Then you remember all these random choices values to the database. Then you pick up a random choice and make proposal on it. For example, you can pick up it uniformly randomly. For example, you pick up this one. And then you run the whole program reusing all random choices whenever possible. So you can reuse this one, you can reuse this one. You can, re you can reuse this one because it has ch changed, but you can reuse this one and just probability will change because the node which it de directly depends on has been changed. Does it make sense? So you can reuse all things excluding this one. And then you calculate a matrix optimization ratio, metropolis hasting algorithm. So you can calculate the probability of old uh, execution. You can calculate the probability of new execution. And you also should consider the transition kernels. And transition kernels is 1 divided by number of random choices, if you select a random choice uniformly randomly. It's local kernel, which we applied here, how you made proposal, what new value have been proposed here. And then there is a new randomness, which hasn't been created here, because this is just a simple bias network. There is no any conditions. But because church is Turing universal language, generally you can have conditions. And then you, if you repeat step from third to fifth, you hopefully converge to from prior to posterior. What about observed statements? Uh, observed statements, it's something which you also evaluate, but in current settings you just force the outermost random choice to be equal to some value. So let's uh, return, for example, to this slide. One moment.
for example, to this slide. You can see that we make bunch of assumes, and then we have observe, get word for document uh, 52 for position at document 3. And you observe word after mobile. You can see that get word, it's a lambda compound procedure, which in its body evaluates something else. So when you evaluate, all evaluation happens here, and just the last random choice, which can be forced, is being forced. So even in this case, it's not the outermost one. This is, this is not church. This is, must be venture. Yeah, but in, new one. church yeah. doesn't do this. Yeah, in church. Uh, church doesn't handle those yeah. statements. Yes, right. yes. So because there is no observed state. This is something you're doing with venture. No? Yes, I can show you how it happens if you want here. So you can see that we want to observe that this is equal to automobile. Let's say automobile has uh, ID number five. For example, if you numerate each word from zero to 500, automobile is fixed. So this is being evaluated, and uh, we evaluate function get topic word sampler. Get topic word sampler is another compound procedure which returns to categorical. So this categorical will be f forced to be equal to five. So this is how it happens. Doesn't make sense. So when for document number fifty-two for so position, this. sorry. This is like what we call biggest precondition. So we have a paper in AI stats where we show how to do this. Exactly. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So I, sorry, what paper it is? I will just write down, okay? Uh, oh, okay, I can write down later, okay? Or oh, if you remember. Yeah, I think the title of a paper I forgot. So okay. sampling probabilistic programs using program analysis. Using program analysis. Yeah. Like we show yeah. systematically how to take the something like this automobile, yeah. propagate it backwards to the right place, and do the forcing correctly. I see. Sample and probabilistic program you're using? Yeah. Uh, uh, program, program analysis. analysis. Program analysis. Great. It's ASTAX 2013. This is ASTAX. And Vikash knows about this. Okay. But, but this is interesting. So once you do the forcing, right, it's not clear to me as to why uh, the next slide when you uh, calculate the beta, right? Okay. Why that is correct? Uh, because you are biasing your run now, right? This is this one? Yeah, the alpha computation. Uh, what is biased? Because now you're forcing automobile to be uh, the, the, that value al uh, x or whatever it is to be equal to automobile, right? Okay. So once you force a value, that biases your run. So it's not like a regular. Run. Yeah, but I don't see any bias because I mean. You are forcing the value. It's not. It's not. You're not sampling from a distribution and 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 then rejecting the sample, right? You're actually saying that I want the sample to be equal to automobile. I agree, but in a mage there is. There is no, it should, nobody tells that it should be sampled. We just calculate, so we have some space. Yeah, you have to calculate the weight for that as well. Yeah, but we have space of all executions. Yes. All possible executions for this Latin Jewish allocation model. Right. And we have this point and this point. These are two different executions. Yes. P, right. Px old and Px new. No, that I understand. But once you say you want a particular sample value to be equal to a, equal to automobile, then it basically says that you like this sample and you don't like this sample because you want to reject all samples which don't have automobile, right? No, we don't reject them, we just don't go right. you through. Don't, you don't reject them, but you don't want to generate them either, right? So which basically introduces a bias. I agree, but in terms of mathematics, I don't see where this... It makes a big difference. In fact, in our paper, we, we give a proof for that. So you are actually introducing the math doesn't work out if you sort of just force values to be equal to uh, force variables to be equal to certain samples equal to certain values like automobile and do so we on. have a board here, board here okay. okay so that's one issue the other issue is you are also memoizing things right okay so it's not clear why this do you have a formal proof as to why this is the correct value why this will indeed converge to the posterior because the no. paper doesn't have this. Yeah, yeah. About that it will convert to posterior, I don't uh, argue in general cases. Because there should be enough ergodicity to convert to posterior. Yeah, yeah. So, 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 in fact, if you don't basically weight these samples accordingly, you will not convert to the posterior. That's what I'm saying. Okay, let's try to understand. Is it connected to ergodicity or is it connected to some problems with probability? It's connected to both because in some... Okay, to ergodicity, point, I agree. Point, at the fixed point, you want to basically say that the fixed point that you compute is indeed the posterior distribution. 
I agree, but this, we have this. Where is the razor? Sorry. Okay, I have got that. We have x old, which is old execution. We have x new, which is new execution. And let's say, let's write simple program. Okay. Complicated. Okay. So let's say I have a very simple program which is x sample from a Bernoulli distribution with mean p. Okay. Or let's say 0.5. Okay. Y you sample from a Bernoulli distribution with mean 0.5, and then you observe let's say x or y. Right. The posterior for this is one one third. Okay. Right. Joint okay. distribution, yeah. and let's say I want to compute the joint distribution of x and y. Now, in order for this to happen, you need to basically force y to be equal to a true, for example. It depends on what x is. If x right. is true, you don't have to force anything. Right. If x is false, you have to force what? Yeah, but how it will happen in venture? In venture, if we consider this, for example, it is a rejection sampling will happen, which is correct. Rejection sampling is correct. Yeah. Or it, that, right? yeah. So I mean, if you do rejection sampling, I agree. I agree. If you force, yeah. you have to be careful. You have to rewrite. If you don't rewrite, it will be wrong. Yeah, but if we are talking about logic like this, yes. this will not work in venture. So, so only if you don't. All memory happens, all of this. Yeah. If you put general conditions, it will just work. Oh, so what conditions are you talking about? So this will happen in venture yeah. using rejection sampling. Okay. Because you cannot force inside or. Exactly. Bec yeah. So with this, I agree. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I agree. And okay. But even for automobile, is an instance of this, right? It's equality constraint. So you, you mm. can say x mm. equals automobile is a specific thing. No, no. For for automobile it works, and I can I mean I can discuss with you why is it's correct. So okay. actually the example of that would be x equals true. You can do. That's what you say. Observe x equals true. You can do. X equals what true. Mean? You can write observe x equals true. Okay. Is that what you mean? You can you can do observe x equals true, right? Okay. Is that is that what you're saying? You can do in that chain. Okay. That's what you can do in that chain. I can. But by, by forcing x to be true. Yes. Uh, but now true will be just forced to be x to just to will be true uh, will be forced just still, to be true. You have to you have to rebate it with weight point five as you force. Right? I mean you can't just force it to you have to weight it with point five. Otherwise it just be wrong. What what do you mean to weight? Because in venture every sample should be associated with a weight which penalizes the fact that you are biased, you have forced it to be a certain value. So in this case, right, if you have if you force x to be equal to your true, then the weight associated with that sample would be point five. You can't you can't replace x chose from a random variable when moving point five with x equals true. And that's incorrect, right? You can say let me force x to be true, but let me add a weight of point five. Then it's that. Can you repeat, please? Right. If you if you transform that program to another program in which you erase the first statement x assigned when moving point five. Okay. With x equals true. Okay. Then it's not correct. I agree. We don't do this. So instead of what we do, we have we just force x to be true and then add a weight of 0.5. Yeah, but I mean, when we see here these probabilities of also force things, we add these weights because they be. Alpha is where you add the weight. Yeah. For example, I mean, p x old and p x new they have this weight of also forced values. Right. Okay. Maybe we can discuss yeah, because, alpha, uh, like, yeah. But 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 the point is okay. That's one point. One question I have, even when I read the church paper, and maybe you fix this in venture, is do you have a formal proof which basically says that this algorithm here computes the correct answer? The uh, posterior, basically. I mean, you say that, right? I mean, it basically computes the posterior, right? But do you have a proof to that effect? Mathematically? No, not yet. And we, and we have not published yet paper on venture exactly because. No, but, but church doesn't have it. I was just curious to know whether venture has that. Because w what proof exactly you mean? Say that the algorithm that you're proposing, like this forward evaluation, remember all choices, blah blah blah, and so on. Okay. Does compute the posterior distribution represented by the probability pro probability program? You have an algorithm which is trying to compute a distribution, right? Okay. You want to say that that algorithm is indeed computing the posterior distribution over the return expressions of the probability program. So, do you have a correspondence between the algorithm and the objective, which is the posterior distribution? We have draft of it. We have draft of it. Yeah, yeah, draft of the proof.
ओके सो एंड एस फॉर प्रोबेस्टिक प्रोग्रामिंग इज इट फाइन सो वी कैन मूव टू टू एग्जाम्पल्स इट्स अप्रॉक्सीमेट बाजन इमेज इंटरप्रिटेशन इज इन जी पी जी पी जेनरल प्रोबेस्टिक ग्राफिक्स प्रोग्रामिंग एंड इट्स बेस्ड ऑन पेपर by Vikashman Sinha by Tejas Kalkarni two first co-authors by me and by professor Joshua Tenenbaum it was accepted for NIPS for full oral presentation and uh, first let's touch computer vision which was very successful and is very successful in recognizing objects characters a lot of alphabets uh, drawing boxes and computer vision is great uh, it's very well established area but they use efficient uh, bottom up approaches for example feature extraction segmentation and uh, to the best of our knowledge there are a few limitations of this for example they require large training corpuses as well as lots of training label data they are difficult to build for example including the software engineering aspect and they are hard to modify they require lots of feature engineering engineering complexity exists and they are clumsy in variability i will touch this in the next slide In addition, humans can do considerably more than modern bottom-up approaches and algorithms. For example, humans can infer a certain level of global understanding from one's uh, image. Or people can also track object relations. That, for example, if I will do this with cup, it will go down the chair stands of floor and other things. And computers, unfortunately, cannot do as well as humans yet. And there is also much variability in 2D scenes, for example. You can see many examples of captures and you can see that how much variability it is and how hard it is to create some bottom up approaches which will deal with all this variability. You also can look to this picture. I don't can we make it turn a bit light off? Oh it's fine. It's fine. Okay. It's yeah, you can see that for optical recognition system it's hard to understand what's written here. But for humans most probably you can guess that it's one four zero PT beware. And we are proposing a new framework which uh, takes a step of addressing some of these limitations. And this con con consists of the high scene generator. For example, where we define the model, we define scene parts, parts, objects on the image, and we define control variables. For example, blue or variance. I will touch what it means. Then, using this uh, values from the high scene generator, values of this. Uh, variables, you use approximate render to generate uh, image from your approximate render. Then you have data, you have real world image, and using stochastic comparison you receive probability. How it's probable that you receive real world image if you have the generated image and if you have control variables, for example, blur and noise. And uh, for example, stochastic scene generator can be written in venture like this. And stochastic comparison can be written like this. For example, when you compare the image, you have the generated image, and you get red channel from this generated image. You get pixel 5 cell from this generated image. Then you add noise, and you use normal Gaussian distribution to add noise to this value. For example, some noise some variance exists. And you compare it, you force it to be equal to 70, 37. It's from the real uh, image value. And from so there, basically, your idea is actually you want to infer now the posterior for the original image. Yes, the and you infer the posterior for the original image. Yeah, and you want posterior to for IR is what you want. Is it? We want to convert to posterior what latent variables values are, because we want to maximize this probability, roughly speaking. So we want to infer latent variables, and I will show what latent variables could be in two examples. So what is IR? What is IR? ID is your data, right? What is yeah, IR? IR is generated oh, I see, image. I see, I see. I see. IR is generated. Yes. Um, oh, I see, I see. And your observed statement will say IR equals ID. Uh, yes, but it's been made with some noise. Oh, I see. IR is ID is noisy version of IR. That's what your observed statement is going to say. Roughly speaking, yes. I I. Sorry, ID is noisy version ID of IR. ID is noisy version of IR. Yes. And from that you want to infer latent variables. Yes. So this is components of GPGP. -GP. It's probabilistic programming to work with generative models. It's automatic inference from probabilistic programming. It's computer graphic approaches because we don't say that bottom-up approaches should not work. 
Uh, and let's consider a simple example. So, sorry for Google. So when you create Google account, you have a capture and you should solve it. And uh, this is how framework works. So you have stochastic generator. I will show you in a second generative model. This is approximate render. So you generate something like this. So this is from the uh, approximate render, based on values from the model, current values. Sorry, it doesn't work. OK. And uh, oh, I see when I press this thing. Sorry, it stops to work. Sorry, I just understood. OK. Uh, and you see that it converge. So stochastic comparison happens. So this is the generative model for this capture example. We have maximum number of letters, 10. We have... Uh, Actually, I didn't quite understand that. Can you go back here? Of course. So is your goal then, what, what letter variables are you inferring here? I mean, that's a, the input capture is, what I see there is actually ID, right? So the picture that I see there is ID. One moment. Where is my mouse? Yeah, this is ID. ID, yeah. And okay. this is IR. OK. And sorry for colors, uh, they inverted. For I, IR, they inverted. And you want to infer the post, your latent variable is now IR. Uh, mm. actually, latent variables variable is not IR. Latent variables are these ones. So in latent variables, are exactly the description of this image. For example, one latent variable is the position X of the letter. So you want to make inference how many letters you have here. What letters IDs are? A, B, C, 1, 5. This is, for example, glyph. You want to make so somehow in the generative model, you have some information. Go back to the previous slides. Like you have some you know, the way I should, since your data looks like five letters, you have maybe five letter variables for what the letters are. No, no, no. Sorry. Something like that. What, is that how I should think about mm, it? It's it's not correct. I'm sorry. Mm. So this is the generative model how it is. So this is the generative model for this example. So in generative model, we have maximum number of letters. So it, okay. yeah, so even in this example, it's it starts from ten, and then it makes inference itself. On to how many of them are actually there? Is it how many of them are present? Okay, I see. I see. You because each one of those can either be present or absent. Yes. So that flexibility. Yes. Yeah, I see. And each one of them has actually a latent variable, which is its position. Yes, it's another latent variable. I see. I see. And its size. That's what I see. Yes, it's rotation. Okay. It's glyph. Okay. What letter it so is? What you are trying to infer is actually of those ten. What is the value? Of, what is the posterior for is present? What is the posterior for pos x? What is the posterior for pos y? What is the posterior for size? That's what you find. Great. Okay. Yeah, totally right. Uh, so these are thin parts, and you can see, for example, using probabilistic programming, you can very easily just add rotation. That's fine. Yeah. yeah. This is uh, stochastic. This is render approximate render, and this is stochastic comparison. And you can see examples. So we created a set of captures, and they converged. So we compared our results with the state of the art optical recognition system, Tesseract. And Tesseract received 37.7% uh, of recognition on this data set we came up with. And our system contains 70.6% of uh, successful recognition. And you can find details in the paper. And here you can see again the convergence. So this, it starts from prior. It just put randomly all things. And then step by step of Metropolis, Hastings, and Gibbs, it converged to the capture, to, to posterior, based on the observation on given ID. Does it make sense, this example? If it, and if it is, I'm going to. Yeah, so, so the one thing I want to ask is actually, you know, what, what am I actually seeing? And I, as it runs, I'm actually getting, as with more and more iterations of MH, yeah. uh, I'm getting more and more precise estimations of post -TV. That's how I should understand. Right. So yes. the way I understand yeah. this is you have a generative model with all these parameters and so on. Mm -hmm. And uh, essentially, that's the input capture. And you want to basically say that whatever you generate plus some noise is equal to that. Yes. And conditioned on, on that observation, you want to estimate the parameters. And then once you estimate the parameters, right, these are the images you're getting for every estimation, right? Roughly. So every everything that you are showing there is 
a different value of parameter, a different value yes. for the parameters. Of letter and variables. Are the let variables. Of the variables. And as you do MH more and more, you are getting more and more precise values of the let variables. Rough is speaking, yes. Yeah. Uh, when we talk about precise in terms of convergence, rough is speaking, yes. No, no, actually, I think what Sridham's question is, why are you not just showing one answer? Why yeah, that's you what I'm asking. Many yeah. answers, right? What is this? Why what are you showing all these What is the video? What is every frame about? Every frame is one choice for a latent wedding. Right? Yes. There are two issues, I mean, the two answers to this question. Why I'm not showing just one frame? Because first of all, it's inference and it takes time to come to answer and we want to see how it comes. Ah, it's first so, answer. Yeah. So it's every iteration, right? Yeah, it's iterations. Yeah. And second answer is sometimes and often in the real li life, there is no just one answer. There are a few answers. And I will show perfect in demo. Most probably you have seen it. But so we so were there is agreed that then there's no one answer, but what does that correspond to with respect to the inference algorithm? Uh, so the, the part I got was well as you are doing your MH, as you're estimating parameters in every iteration, you, you are every frame basically shows you for that choice of inferred latent variables. That's the image rate. But if there's no one answer that uh, that, that's a problem which cannot be solved by the inference algorithm. Why? I don't understand. I don't. I'm, maybe I'm wrong, but I don't agree because in inference, inference happens, and it just will, if if there are two answers, and if there is ergodicity, it, it will just move from one answer to another. No, no, but that's a different story altogether, right? I mean, moving from one answer to the other is basically just the process of inference. But I agree. By no way does it suggest that it's you are reporting two different answers. Oh, I mean, if you want, you can. What you can do, you just can. No, no, no. that's not what's happening here. I agree. Yeah, that's here it. Saying, yeah, right? here it can reach to. Yeah, yeah, right. Convince me that there's another way to do that. Whatever. Ah, yeah, I agree. Totally agree with you. Yeah, yeah. I'm agree. Okay, so because of time, because I want to show also demos, I'll go this. I will very briefly will touch this slide. So what happens here? We just want to show this high stochasticity in the model with much enough uh, uh, blur and global blur and uh, noise. In, in the model, we receive better convergence. So if there is low stochasticity, it doesn't converge. But if it, there is high stochasticity, there is enough noise, and by noise I mean Gaussian blur, and if there is enough, enough blur on the image like this, it converge. But by high stochasticity and low stochasticity, I should just think about this as uh, the stochasticity of your model, itself. You generate a model itself. Yes, in the generative model. Not in the, in the uh, you know, image process. Yeah, image is the same for the all same. things. And second problem is uh, finding road and left out of road and right of road. It's a classical data set of this problem, Kitty data set. Bunch of frames. And the framework here looks uh, the same. We have uh, the highest we, we have a probabilistic graphic program, which is the high generator. We have approximate render, and then this generated image, we compare it with real world image. So this is a generative model for this example. I'm sorry, I'm still, I mean, you know, I, I, I understood your first example a lot better, that you have recognition that you want to do. What is that? What is it you're trying to solve here? Okay. One moment, I will show the problem. Yeah, you so we are trying to find where there is a road, where there is right of road, left of road, and uh, lanes. So this is problem for driverless car. So it doesn't make sense now? So we're trying to figure out from a picture where the road is. Yes. Okay. Actually, India, it makes a lot of sense. <laughs> 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 it's much harder, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> In Russia it's the same, so yeah. Uh, <laughs> the US simple algorithms could work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I agree. Uh, so, 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 so this is a generative model now. Yeah. And this generative model uh, also incorporates road and left and right as well, or only the road? Le road, left and right. Okay. So, so, so the only problem is this. So basically, is the information you're going to use that anything that the car drove through is road? Is that, is that, is that, are these the kinds of things that... I mean, I, I, yes, you know, yes, yes. So if the car actually drives through something, the fact that the car went through there means that it's road. Those that, the kind of information you want to use? Or? Uh, you, you mean why we are solving this problem? No, no, I'm just saying what, what is the information? 
what is what is your, what is the intuitive definition of a road? Oh, intuitive definition of the road is yes, where ca where ca car where can car go. Goes through. <laughs> where car car should go through, where car must go through. This is a US assumption. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yes. Yeah, so, so basically, you can't just be, you know, observed statements are actually where the car actually went through. Those are the observed statements. Oh, no, are, sorry, I just, before I just was on philosophical uh, point of view. Uh, in terms of generative model, it's a bit different. So we use a one train image. So we, by hand, uh, Mark where there is road, left of road, and rough, right of road. Let's okay, okay. let's start from this. So, let's see how it happens. We have uh, one train image. Can I ask one question? Of course, of course. So, are you using one image or a sequence of images? Are you we so in data set there are about, if I'm right, 400 images in the data set. In, in sequence. Yeah, they in sequence. Okay. Uh, we use one train image and we test on a few test images, about 50. But if your question about does the fact, the fact that we have sequence matter, this is the question, yeah. it doesn't matter. Why? Because in computer vision they, they used to consider each frame separately. Roughly speaking, not to use information from the previous image on this one, which is bad in terms of of course, if you have posterior from the previous image, on the next frame, posterior on the next image will be very, very close, roughly speaking. But because in computer vision they used to consider each frame separately, we do the same thing. And, we compare when, and when we compare with state-of-the-art techniques, we do the same thing. But of course, if we solve the real problem, problem we should get benefits from the fact that we have sequence. So what we do? We have this image. And first, we using k-means algorithm, we reduce number of colors. We reduce information up to 40, 20 colors, from this to this. And then by hand on one train image, we mark uh, where is the road, lanes, and where is the right of road and left of road. We work so done manually. Well, yeah, for done one train image, it's done manually. And, and, and this will form your observed statement. Yes. And then we, for each part of four, we have histogram, col color code book, code book of this frame. So this histogram is just histogram for this road, what 20 colors are there, in what uh, proportion they are located in this region. Does it make sense? Uh, roughly, I mean, I, I'm still thinking is that, okay, so you do this for one image. Now, if I show you a different road, how are you going to use this? Yeah, I mean, if it will be considered a different road, it will not work. If, for example, settings of the uh, world has changed, for example, night has come, it will not work. I see, I see, I see. Yeah, and uh, this is a limitation, so I agree. But this is standard classical data set which people work on. For example, there is another paper I will show you. So, Actually, the point is, what is the objective of this data set? I mean, once you mark it, you have an observed statement now, and you learn what the latent variables are, and then what do you what do you predict? I, what is that info? We we have four hundred images, images. Yeah. and the problem is classical. Using a few train images, yeah. you want to predict for all others where road is located. So yeah, the problem formulation. The probabilistic program is not clear. So. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to discuss it. Of course, yeah. yeah. The, roughly speaking, how we use probabilistic program, pro programming. We have generative model yes. and can, with connection to bottom-up approach, which I'm describing here with this color code book, mm -hmm. we solve the problem. So, so given the, the training set, you can learn what the latent variables are. And then what do you do with the test set? I don't know. In, we, we don't learn latent variables for, because latent variables, all latent variables for Train image, roughly speaking, are provided by humans. Mm -hmm. So we are still interested to figure out latent variables for train image. Yeah, for the training image. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, for test, I'm sorry, for test image. We are still interested to figure out ra latent variables for the train, for the test for image. Test, okay, for, yeah. Then what are you doing with the training? Then? How are you making use of the training? Image? Uh, you use the code book, uh, we use, yes, so here, this is a generative model for one test image. Mm -hmm. 
we are interested to infer road width, road height, lane positions, lane size. And we are provided with this color histograms from the terrain image. Okay. So I, I see. So I guess the way to look upon this is that you have a generative model and there's let's say n related variables. Some of them basically uh, are uh, inferred from from the training set. And the rest of them you want to basically infer for each of the test images. Is that the way to look upon this? Mm, I'm thinking. I mean, we we. We can turn it in this way, <coughs> methodology, method, methodologically. Mm. I don't know if we should do it. I mean, I, I see what you mm. what you are proposing. Mm. I don't know methodologically should we think in this way or not. I don't know. I, I, I can think, thank you. So I like to consider this that we have some prior information about the world, which is based on one train image. And then we have just test image or test images and we have the problem formulation, how it was. I see. So the what, is your, set, what is your current connection between the latent variables for the training images? There is no and latent, latent variables for the test. I think what he's saying is all the information that you get out from the training set will go into the prior for the generative model, and all the latent information is is inferred for each of the Tr test, test, image. test test images. So whatever training data he has, he's going to put it as mark it as prior knowledge. Because what the purpose is to talk about? But it's not clear. I guess the main confusion in our mind is it's not clear immediately clear as to how you convert the training set information into priors. I see. I mean, the other thing I'm confused by. That's why that you're thinking. You know, you want to infer both, right? I mean, I'm sorry. The, the other thing I'm confused by is that I thought in the test image you don't have the actual marking of the road. You don't have it. Right? That's what we're trying to infer. Yes. For the customer. We don't have. You don't have, right? So, if you don't somehow use the information from the training images, I am just thinking in terms of exactly you know the probabilistic program, the observed statement. When you have the test data, you don't have an observed statement for the test data, is it? We have for test data. We have observed. This what, is is the, what is the observed data for the test data? We are for the test. We have okay. Maybe I will just describe the model. Well, it and, yeah, yeah. So it's, it's really clear. It's really clear. for the training one. What the observed statement is roughly clear. So the test image. The whole image, I suppose. I mean, you just observe whatever you have. There. The colors, this, that, and so on. Oh, but you don't know about the road. You don't know about the road. That, that's the latent variable, basically. Yeah. I, I will describe I the whole thing, okay, and then we. But you see, actually, you know, the, the last example you gave me is very, very clear. Uh, yeah, I mean, this is not I, I, I hope this also will become clear when I will okay. <laughs> describe it, okay? Okay, so you understand what this means for terrain image, this color code book. Actually, I'm not going to tell you. Can you describe what a color code book is again? Okay. So we have uh, this tra one terrain that image. That's clustering. Yes. We, we by hand divide them for four regions. Now we have one of four regions the road and and this road in this region there are 20 different colors and we can receive the histogram of this uh, region what is the y axis y axis is number of colors 20 and y axis is the uh, is probability of receiving color number 1 in this region so say x axis is the number of colors y axis is actually fraction of the image with that color yes okay. fraction of Colors within this image. Within this image. Yeah, for each color, how much fraction it occupies in the image? Yes. Okay. It, not an image, sorry, in this region. In the region. region. Yeah, in the region. Yes, histogram for every region. Yeah. Oh, I see, I see, I see, I see. So row will have one characteristic. Yeah. Tree will have another characteristic. That's, so you yes. are now characterizing a region by its uh, color composition. Great, great. Uh, okay, now it makes sense. To now he's going to use that as prior. Okay, okay, wait. Okay. <laughs> okay, great. And now you can see the samples from geometrical prior. So these are just samples from geometrical prior. And you can see that there's much variability. So roughly speaking, road can be everywhere. Makes sense. And then when we have road, for example, here, for example, here or here, what happens? Now imagine that this is a test image. 
and imagine that we put a rod here and we extract the histogram of this region of this test image and then we just using multinomial distribution using noisy comparison we compare this color coded book extracted from train from test image with color coded book of the same region of train image and this is what we compare in stochastic comparison and here you can see a typical assembled image so you remember that ID the real world image it's IR rendered image plus noise you remember this and if we use multinomial and roughly speaking this is generated image from the generative model without noise still by the way so you can see that this is lanes and the, you, can, you see here this histogram for each of region does it make sense? Yeah. So, great okay and these are results and you can see that we, there is state-of-the-art approach eight, early at all 2008 and they received accuracy 68% if we use to one train image we receive 64% uh, if, we, if we use 15 uh, train images we receive 74% and then we use just maximum likelihood over a few train images runs. Does it make sense? Yes, I'm, I'm thinking that basically you are, we have to think with the program now is that when you, get a, you use the train images to calculate, you know, I guess priors for each of these color distributions and then you give me a test image, you would want the inferred color distribution to be somewhat constrained by a noisy approximation to the uh, priors that you got from the training set. That's, that's how that's what a published program is doing. You're, sorry, can you repeat it? Yeah, so basically you have, I'm just trying to repeat what I said, which is that you have a bunch of training set, and from these training sets, then for each region, whether it is road or outside or all these regions, you are calculating uh, uh, the distributions for your uh, for your color, okay, color coded books, and then when you give me a new image, you don't know the classification as well, right? But you want to write a model such that the classification in regions, and you want to generate a classification using a generative model such that. If I take that classification and calculate the color code book for that classification. By classification you mean finding where a road is located? Yeah. Yes. Okay. By, by the values of flight you, you, you want to find where the road is located. Okay. Such that the generative model will generate that. But you will put a constraint saying that I, I, want, a, I, want, a, I want a classification such that if I calculate the color code book, then the color code book will be a noisy variant. Of the color code books that I've seen in all the and training very day. close, it, noisy close. but very close. Very close. That's basically what you do. Great. Right. Thank you. Sorry, it took some time. No, no, no. no. <laughs> it, my, I'm sorry. Okay, so now I we finished with examples, and I'm going to touch briefly two things. So first work is based on preliminary work with Wickersman Sinha, with Jeff Wu, with Daniel Selson, with other people, and uh, it's how to scale up inference in probabilistic programs and uh, we have universal inference machine and we want to be to make it faster to make inference tractable and you remember this uh, Bayesian network and you remember that we make proposal on this uh, node but really we don't want to rerun the whole network because values of this node hasn't have not been changed probability of this part and of this part have not been changed and only probability of this guy has changed, has been changed, and probability of these two guys have been changed, because they conditionally directly depends on this guy. And here we come to the notion from graphic from graphical models of Markov blanket. 
And you can try to use the same thing in settings of church, but a bit advanced because we have the fact we we should deal with the fact that in graphical models they are usually fixed, while in our case they can be changed because you can have conditions because church is a universal language. So I will. Yeah, yeah, good. It's, it's great and really you can, if you save dependencies of this guy whose its children are, you can calculate these probabilities. And you don't, should not reevaluate the whole program, calculate probabilities of all nodes. And you can see that we made this preliminary work and you can see that in random DB implementation where we run the whole program, it grow, goes quadratically where we increase the linear number of data points. While if you write handwritten sample, it should go linearly. For example, this is Ising model. And if we use our computation traces engine, where we track, keep track of dependencies, we receive linear growth. And additionally to this... So this, what, this guy is actually sort of number of samples per second, or what, what are you getting? No, no, no. This is uh, average time for one MH scan. And one MH scan, so let's say in uh, HMM. Each run. Each run. Each run on the whole model. Let's say in HMM you have 100 okay. latent variables, steps, and you... One scan will be go, go in, for example, in Gibbs over all these things. And your savings you're getting is because you're not processing all the data. So you're using the blanket and you're acting possible yes. only subject to the Yeah, kind of blanket. V version of it because it's not correct for us to talk about blanket because the structure of graphical model can change in our case because we have conditions. But yeah, you, it, your, your intuition is great. And I, second thing, as well in, in graphical models, if we have track of these dependencies, we can make inference in two parts which are not corrected, connected in parallel, approximate inference. And we also have very preliminary results on it. I wrote in closure version of church, venture church, and uh, you can see that we receive uh, this uh, standard curve. This is ideal curve when you increase number of threads and average speed up increases linearly. And what we have, you can see here, and uh, we think that this drop down appears because uh, we don't deal with memory as it should be. So we are really interested in this and we think we received good uh, preliminary understanding that approximate inference happens and can happen in venture settings. In church settings. So basically, I mean, the way I should think about it is that in some sense the number of independent parts that you have should tell you how much gains you will get if you have that I agree. If you have, it's inherent to the model. I, I agree. I agree, but if you think of what you just told, if you think it's connected to this, I don't think so because we had big enough model. So I agree with you about this, but I think this is because we don't work with memory good enough. But I guess the other thing is that your notion of independence also is not exact, right? it's approximate, I guess. It's dynamic. So the question I have is, well, with, with this optimization, without this optimization, so when you compare, right, are you producing the same answers? Yeah, good question. So we have... Uh, ah, not, okay, 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 okay. Yeah, they'll give it a graph. And you, okay. sorry, can I switch off the light? How it works here? I, we don't see... For some reason it produced other colors. But okay, I mean, there are also curves here. I mean, this, I don't know why, in the notebook I see it. Okay, this is goes here. So roughly speaking, you can see that if you use one core, it goes this way. 
if you have two cores it goes this way faster and if you have four cores it goes here you can look on my notebook if you want and yeah so it, it converts faster and if, if you, uh, I describe this preliminary work and I also want to describe uh, so if you have questions here please ask and it's 12 but what, what else do you have? Can you just tell oh, yeah, of course. Have? I mean, second okay. is just my personal research proposal draft. That? Maybe it's really yeah, 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 great. Great, great. Great, okay. Okay, and I have a few demos which we like to present to people. Okay, sure. Uh, this is curve fitting demo. Do you see the slides? What's written on slides? Uh, so this is the very cla um, basic Bayesian curve fitting we can put points and we'll find the line. So the model described as follow as follow. We can we have coefficient C0, C zero C one for line. We have linear function as a compound procedure, the lambda function, just plus C zero multiply C one X, where X is one input argument. We also have noise to add stochasticity to the model and each point is observation of uh, I have a question, right? Of course. Why, I mean, why doesn't this come like? Why is it jumping around? Because it samples from pas from distribution using metropolis Hudson algorithm. So the point is not to maximize the probability. The point is just to receive samples from distribution using. Basically, basically, what what this means is that the, there's basically no sort of stable equilibrium for the system. It actually just goes somewhere, and then because. Yes, if you keep running a match, it will actually get out of it, and it will just yes. guess new things. Yes, so, so I should think about it. Yes, yes, and I think it's very beautiful because, as I told, in the real world there is usually there are two beautifulness, beauty things. <laughs> First is that you in real world there are few, usually a few explanations. Second one is that you are not you don't become stuck in local minimums. So this is clear, right? I can show advanced curve fitting demo. So this is the same curve fitting, but now we have uh, polynomial up to fourth degree, and we have uh, first degrees of uh, Fourier series, and we also set points, and it samples different explanations again. And you can see that the uh, radius of the circle is noise. And for example, this is line like this, right? And guess what will happen if I will put here point? With the, with the, with the same degree? Yes. Uh, I mean, degree is being made inference on online. The way online, yeah, you, yeah. You see, explanations have been changed. So, I mean, I don't do anything, but it just has changed the explanation from polynomial first degree, so linear. Oh, up see, to so, so, degree is also another uh, uh, random variable. That's how I think about. It. Yes. Hmm. Poly I, order. I, I, I would suspect it would just vary widely. Like, yes. Okay. It just became outlier just because outlier. in yeah in the model we have outliers. Yeah. And this also has become outlier. Oh, because in the model you have outliers too. Yeah, yeah. So right. we have. So basically, the model just somehow decided to pick that as an outlier. Yeah, yeah. And model is just this, up to this. And so about maybe tw twenty lines of yes, 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 of yes, yes, venture yes, code. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah. So are you saying actually that the, if you don't have non Bayesian viewpoint, an outlier is hard to define? Is that what your point is? No. If I do least squares, right? Is outlier? Least oh, yeah, right? I, I mean, yeah. I, I, yes, but it is not the major point I want to provide. The major point I want to provide is probabilistic programming is good in two senses because it's compact compositional representation of model, and second because you can ben get benefit of automatic inference techniques, which people can advance and generally use. Yeah, but that's true. But I thought actually there's a third one, right? Like for example, I can now have a model. So that suddenly I can decide to model outliers, and nothing changes. It's very easy for me to change the program to also have outliers. I agree. Which I agree. And, and at the moment I invent outliers, right? If I were in optimization, I have to now do a new formulation, the LP formulation or something like that, and I have to do math in order to, I mean, in some sense, 
you know, it goes to the point that actually you don't have to now build a new inference algorithm, which also includes outliers, right? Which you would if you were in SVM. You have to write a separate paper. And Great. So hopefully you don't yeah. write a separate paper. So rather than, yeah, we reduce number of papers. <laughs> <laughs> That's the goal. Yes. There is our papers. Yes. It's a great goal to have. <laughs> so fewer students have to read it. It's a great goal. There is another optimization problem. Yes. And last example. Actually, by the way, actually, we are very interested in this work. Actually, we are building an inference of ourselves, as, as you may have heard from Aditya and so on. So, I mean, in spite of all our group comments, we really like this work. <laughs> Great. <laughs> and this is last demo therapy mixture mm -hmm. where you have clusters. And um, the model is again from here to here. It's classical Chinese restaurant process mixture. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, you see here how inference happens. And uh, how do you. <coughs> And uh, you, you see point here, right? And let's I will add point here. And you can see that there are a few explanations for this point now, right? And you can see that sometimes it's, uh, oh, sorry, this, I'm sorry, this thing has. So you see three points here and two points here. And if I add point here, it's either separate or they're connected. So we see different explanations. OK, I, yeah, I, I'm done with Thank the you. presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.